Okay, let's talk about Gregory Coles and his beef with reintegrative therapy. Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psycho Bible, babbling about psychology and theology. A few months ago, Gregory Coles put out a few blog articles criticizing the Carolyn Pila and Phil Sutton study from 2021 showing how reintegrative therapy increases well-being and facilitates sexual attraction fluidity. Fluidity meaning change. Now, who is Gregory Coles? He's the author of Single Gay Christian and apparently the senior research fellow, whatever that means, at Preston Sprinkle's Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. Both of them are big names in the Revoice Conference and proponents of Side B Gay Christianity. What is Side B? Well, whereas Side A Gay Christianity is fully affirming pro-gay revisionist theology, Side B agrees that people are just inherently, and for the most part, immutably homosexually oriented. But they're not affirmative of homosexual behavior. Therefore, they promote options like celibacy just by default for having per persistent same-sex attraction. Spiritual friendships, which are committed, non-sexual, but deeply intimate same-sex partnerships and so-called mixed-orientation marriages, such as a guy with same-sex attraction marrying a woman. They would argue that they support the historic orthodox sexual ethic of the church. Well, side tangent, I would disagree, because their ethic stops short of surrender of one's identification, thoughts, and feelings to the lordship and redeeming, healing wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit. And so, because of all that, when Gregory Cole sees a study showing a therapeutic approach that could help people, people like him, better understand their same-sex attractions and experience change in those attractions, he scoffs with skepticism. I heard about these blog posts he did some time ago, and it's been on my agenda to more thoroughly read and respond to them. As my viewers know, I am training in reintegrative therapy, doing consulting of Joe Nicolosi Jr. I even knew, however briefly, his father, Joe Nicolosi Sr., the father of reparative therapy. And from my time in the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, I know Drs. Carolyn Pila and Phil Sutton. And I proudly had P Dr. Pila and Dr. Nicolosi Jr. on my channel earlier this year to discuss this study that Gregory is scrutinizing. After reading his articles, it sure seems like he has such a bone to pick with change-allowing therapies that he sounds just like any one of the pro-LGBT activists we routinely encounter and try to oppose our work and straight-up outlaw us. Well, don't take my word for it. Let's read through his blogs, and then I'll add my commentary. In his blog titled, Is Reintegrative Therapy Making People Straight? Part 1 published on May 4th, 2022. He says, If you visit the website of the Reintegrative Therapy Association, you'll see a triumphant announcement on their homepage declaring, Landmark study shows trauma treatment significantly alters sexual attractions. Dig deeper into the website and you'll find this elaboration. We know from large-scale longitudinal evidence that reintegrative therapy is associated with statistically significant decreases in same-sex attractions, increases in heterosexual attractions, changes in sexual identity toward a heterosexual identity, and increases in psychological well-being. For example, decreases in, in anxiety, depression, and suicidality. It's worth noting that reintegrative therapy is the brainchild of Dr. Joseph Nicolosi Jr., whose father, Nicolosi Sr., was the founder of reparative therapy. Although the term reparative therapy has sometimes been used as a synonym for all forms of sexual orientation change efforts, or conversion therapy, reparative therapy refers specifically to Nicolosi Sr.'s clinical approach, which claimed to heal same-sex orientation in men by addressing childhood wounds and traumas, specifically poor relationships with their fathers in psychotherapy. All right, end quote. Why the quotation marks around heal? In his footnote, he simply points out that Nicolosi's 1993 book was titled 
healing homosexuality. If the quotes are meant to indicate skepticism or incredulity, that actually reveals something about Cole's view regarding the nature of homosexuality. I've often seen it depicted that the perspective of these side-B gay Christian types is that same-sex attraction is some sort of unwanted affliction caused by the fall and which they must learn to bear with long-suffering. But to scoff at the prospect of this affliction being healed betrays a level of acceptance or even endorsement of the attractions as a part of their personhood that they would not want to part with. Keep that in mind as we keep reading his blogs. He continues, In reintegrative therapy, the approach remains largely the same, though the claims are somewhat more muted. Instead of describing sexual orientation change as the goal of their therapy, they write that it is a byproduct of trauma treatment. They also incorporate the recent and widely respected trauma therapy technique EMDR, which is uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing a physiological strategy for reprocessing past trauma through eye movement. Just an interjection, it's really through uh, bilateral stimulation, or really, if you want to look more into it, the theory behind it, look up uh, adaptive information pr processing. Anyway, back to his article. In one sense, there's much to appreciate about reintegrative therapy. Helping people of any sexual orientation process past trauma and find healing from that trauma is always a good thing. And insofar as processing trauma happens to cause someone to experience their sexuality differently, I see no need to object to such a shift, per se. But of course, this returns us the inevitable question. How effective is reintegrative therapy in bringing about sexual orientation change? What is this large-scale, longitudinal evidence that connects reintegrative therapy to statistics to statistically significant decreases in same-sex attractions." Unquote. Notice the terminology here. Experience their sexuality differently. I see this frequently with Preston Sprinkle's group. Instead of believing that sexuality, if understood as sexual proclivities and attraction and arousal patterns, can actually change, it appears that the underlying assumption is that one's sexuality, or sexual orientation according to them, is a stable construct. What changes is one's experience of it, whatever that means. Coles insinuates that reintegrative therapy's goal is to change sexual orientation. He's inserting a construct that neither the Pila and Sutton study, or article, nor reintegrative therapy's literature uses at least not without any, any sort of qualification. Sexual orientation itself is not a valid research construct. This is well understood in the research community. That's why you see terms like same-sex attraction experiences, or men who have sex with men, MSM, not mainstream media. They're breaking down sexual orientation into dimensions or subdomains that are measurable and concrete, such as identity slash self-label, behavior, thoughts, and feelings, or also arousal, rather than some vague global concept being misused as an identity label. From the Pila and Sutton article itself, page 63, quote, further, in contradiction to the narrative that accepting and embracing a sexual orientation is the best option for psychological health. Diamond, meaning Lisa Diamond, notes an association between psychological maturity in women and the rejection of self-labeling in accordance with sexual attraction experiences. Finally, the American Psychological Association agrees that individuals can and do experience SAF, sexual attraction fluidity, stating, quote, Sexual attraction and sexual orientation identity are labeled and expressed in many different ways, some of which are fluid, unquote. Fully unquote. In his footnote, Coles elaborates, I am, however, deeply concerned about the ethics of working with gay clients 
whose reason for pursuing therapy is their desire to become straight, then implying to those clients that a change in their sexual orientation is a likely byproduct of therapy, and yet claiming that this therapy is not in fact an effort to change sexual orientation. It's also worth asking whether a shift from same-sex orientation to opposite-sex orientation is experientially or spiritually advantageous. Since my thoughts on that latter topic are already available here and here, I won't revisit them at present. First off, it's not semantics when we say that reintegrative therapy is not trying to change sexual orientation. One, because gay and straight are false social constructs. The paradigm of the world, which side B Christians like Gregory Coles adhere to, is that your sexual feelings reveal your true sexuality something that just is. Therefore, the idea of changing such attractions is, to them, akin to changing the very nature of who you are. But that's an old, outdated paradigm. Pro-gay psychologists like lesbian Linda Garnett's as far back as 2001, and more recently with lesbian Lisa Diamond, have been trying to explain to people that the old model of rigid boxes of gay and straight and bi and so on and so forth is simply false. But rather, orientation, according to them, is on a continuum and encompasses multiple dimensions, attractions, behavior, and identity. Secondly, we explicitly tell people in re reintegrative therapy that change in attractions or orientation is not the goal of reintegrative therapy because reintegrative therapy is a methodology not an ideology it's the same method used for other addictions such as binge eating we look into the attractions and behavior mindfully neither pro nor anti-gay and as we discover past wounds or unmet needs we do trauma reprocessing then we find as a result that the feelings toward the fantasy might change consequently. We even tell people to try to directly change your attractions or your orientation can interfere with the therapy process. So it's best just to focus on what can you discover and focus on getting healthier and, and processing that trauma. And did you catch that? This quote? It's also worth asking whether a shift from same-sex orientation to opposite-sex orientation is experientially or spiritually advantageous? If you're someone who wants to romantically and sexually function according to your biological design, especially if you have religious convictions about sexual morality, wouldn't it be helpful if the intensity of the same-sex eroticization were reduced and interest in a person of the opposite sex was to blossom? Surely you see how that would help the person be more integrated, right? We're not even talking about categorical change, which is what he's insinuating when he says shift from same-sex orientation to opposite-sex orientation. Because he's stuck on this outdated paradigm of sexual, sexual identity being distinct and innate. But if someone were to experience a genuine, complete change in attraction, thoughts, behavior, and identity, how would that not be advantageous? If it actually happens, and it isn't just a person white-knuckling or being in denial of persisting feelings, it better aligns that person with God's design. My hunch is that the only reason someone would oppose that degree of genuine change would be because the person has an ideological commitment and affection for holding on to same-sex attraction and a gay identity. Well, he then lists some links to explain what he means. Oh, this ought to be good. Let's check them out. The first one is from September 2017. You don't need to pray that God makes me straight. He starts off by saying, It is a truth universally acknowledged that a good conservative Christian boy who realizes he's gay, will spend years in agonized and fervent prayer asking God to make him straight. At least that's what I did. 
Beginning at the age of 12, I measured my spiritual life according to my progress towards heterosexuality. See the paradigm he's stuck in? That my feelings indicate what I am. And so he's praying fervently that God change him at a categorical level, from gay to straight. And that's what I hear so much from my clients and people I know, that they prayed for years that God would just change it, just take it all away, and make, make them straight, as if that's something that they aren't, and that they just need a complete transformation of their entire personhood. And so the idea he gets is that if loving Jesus was supposed to be turning me straight, I obviously didn't love Jesus very much. And so he just keeps at it. He's fervently trying to prove his love to Jesus by becoming straight. But look at this quote here. But I've stopped praying to be straight. In fact, most of the time, I've stopped wanting to be straight. If you offered me a choice today between a wonder pill that makes gay people straight and a Tylenol, I'd take the Tylenol. So right there, he sees that he would rather stay in his state of persistent same-sex attraction experiences rather than see a change in his thoughts and feelings at a deep level. Let's look at the second blog he links from November 2021, Meditations on My Spam Folder. He describes going into his email spam folder and seeing an email about hot Russian babes and laughing at how it doesn't apply to him. And he says, Let me propose as delicately as possible that this brand of spam marketing to men is one of the many negative consequences of the normative sexual experience we call heterosexuality. You can read the blog. I'll, I'll just sum up that ultimately he's saying that, yes, he could be vulnerable to some other type of ad that would be geared more toward guys with same-sex attraction, but he's using this incident to highlight how in his experience, when Christians talk about sexual brokenness, he always received it as a euphemism for same-sex orientation. That's not been my experience, uh, but I can understand why he would have that experience, because so many of the ministries that have developed over the years to address sexual brokenness were originally ex-gay ministries. I thank God for this, because... If it wasn't for the ex-gay ministry movement, we probably wouldn't have as many ministries devoted to actual, true, sexual integrity and wholeness. And fortunately, a lot of the former Exodus member ministries and those that are still ministries that are part of Restored Hope Network and therapists that I know in this type of field, we don't work exclusively with guys dealing with same-sex attraction. We work with anyone with any form of sexual brokenness. And we understand that that includes not just some form of same-sex attraction, but all the other forms of opposite-sex attraction uh, that is geared toward someone other than your spouse, or, or using your spouse as an object for your gratification, rather than, rather than viewing her as a person worthy of the true full gift of yourself. So, there's a, an array of sexual brokenness, and he's come to associate that as being only geared toward the LGBTQ. And so, ultimately what he's getting at is that we're all sexually broken, and there's types of sexual brokenness that are for gay people and types that are for straight people. And he laments that his experience has been that only gay people are considered sexually broken by their very existence. See, once again, it's this taking on of homosexuality as his identity as what he is, rather than the same-sex attraction experiences as being just that. An experience that actually contradicts his own design, his actual identity as a male, created by God for union with a female. No, he sees himself as a gay man. But interestingly, he ends the article with this. Thankfully, by the delightful grace of God, our brokenness isn't the end of the story. Amen to that. But it continues, We acknowledge the ongoing consequences of the fall on our hearts and lives, not as a form of self-flagellation, but as a way of making room for the transformative work of Jesus. 
Jesus came not for the already perfect, but for those of us who continue to grapple with our old sin nature. Hint, this is all of us. Jesus came even for the sexually broken, even for those whose orientation reflects the consequences of the fall of humankind, even for the heterosexuals. And yet, these side B gay Christians, while he's on one hand talking about the transformative work of Jesus, will generally be opposed to ministries that help people with sexual brokenness, whether we're talking about same-sex attraction or not. They generally are skeptical at best, if not downright opposed to our work. And yet he speaks of the transformative nature, or the transformative work of Jesus. So, try to make sense of that one. Well, ultimately, as I suspected, he discounts the seriousness of his propensity to eroticize members or features of his own sex, and he equivocates homosexuality with heterosexuality, not seeing or recognizing that the very direction of the attractions in someone who experiences same-sex attraction is a distortion in, its, in, in and of itself. But he finds offense at viewing that as broken. This shows what really characterizes this side B gay Christianity. It's all one big contradiction. They're affirming of the identity, but not affirming of the behavior. Can you picture the type of counseling you would get from these people? You need to accept that you're gay. Your sexuality is just who you are. It's part of your broken humanity that we all have. Okay, sure. But you can't act on it. So you need to accept it, but not act on it. There's no understanding of what underlies it all. No true compassion. A compassion that, that motivates you to help the person find healing and progress and growth and maturity into, into manifesting their true integrity, wholeness. And it's quite apparent in these blog posts that because of his past pain, he's prematurely foreclosed the possibility of greater reintegration, healing, and transformation. And this, I find, explains the level of haughty skepticism, meticulous scrutiny, and contempt he has for sexual attraction fluidity exploration in therapy. It's sprinkled all throughout his blog, as you'll soon see. Back to the original blog about reintegrative therapy, part one. The evidence is described in an article titled Sexual Attraction Fluidity and Well-Being in Men, a Therapeutic Outcome Study, written by Carolyn Pila and Philip Sutton, published in the Journal of Human Sexuality in 2021. On its face, the research sounds impressive. It's a two-year longitudinal study of 75 adult males, measuring their levels of same-sex attraction, opposite-sex attraction, and psychological well-being. At the end of the study, the researchers found that participants' same-sex attraction had diminished, opposite sex attraction had increased, and psychological well-being had increased. There you have it. The therapy works! Problem solved! What's not to love? Do you smell the sarcasm and contempt? Well, now he's going to proceed to give some of the most laughable criticisms I've seen of a research study. As we read through his criticism, ask yourself what his motivations could be. He claims that there's so many things wrong with the study that he needs two blog posts to cover them all. Really, this must be some shoddy research that this so-called senior research fellow has uncovered. He starts with trying desperately to discredit the journal that finally published the study. He writes, one reason we tend to trust scientific studies is that we believe they've been highly vetted during the peer review process, a process overseen by the academic journals where the studies are published. Any fool with a PhD after a name can string together some words and throw them online for the world to read, for example the blog post you are currently reading. But publishing in a credible journal means that other renowned experts have examined your data and your arguments affirmed their credibility, and commended them to the broader academic field. 
The Journal of Human Sexuality sounds like this sort of credible publication, the kind of journal that would highly vet its publications. Unfortunately, the name is more grandiose than the reality. The Journal of Human Sexuality is the publishing arm of the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, ATCSI, an organization whose mission includes promoting a more complete truth about the science of sexual orientation. In their statement on sexual orientation change dated 2012, nine years before Pila and Sutton's purportedly landmark study, ATCSI declares that they are committed to protecting the rights of clients with unwanted same-sex attractions to pursue change as well as the rights of clinicians to provide such psychological care. In other words, the people who published this study already knew which conclusions the study needed to reach. The Pila and Sutton study was published in the Journal of Human Sexuality not because, or at least not simply because, it was objectively good scientific work but also because it matched the organization's pre-existing ideological commitments. And then he just doubles down in his footnote here. Of course, no publication venue is without bias. The academic peer review process tends to be biased towards the preferential attitudes of the academy as a whole. But academic journals are formed around professional communities that develop biases organically over time. <laughs> These journals also tend to have a dissenting minority within their community. <laughs> yeah, right. By virtue of the breadth of most professions, and tend to experience gradual shift in those biases over time in response to cultural shifts and new findings in the field. ATCSI, on the other hand, is specifically formed around an ideological position. And it simply draws people from any discipline who share that ideological position it definitionally excludes an objecting minority as being outside of the journal's scholarly community in ways that a true scholarly community could never pull off, m much as they might wish to at times. ATCSI's self-definition renders impossible any meaningful shifts in response to new findings in the field. In some ways, the biases of an ac academic journal could be more insidious than ATSI's biases because they are more hidden. At the same time, the biases of academic journals are also less egregious because these journals do privilege, at least to some degree, the intellectual necessity of dissent. <laughs> I laugh because it just shows his ignorance about what actually goes on at these other journals. This is pretty much just downright libelous. The Journal of Human Sexuality is a credible journal. I just did an interview with Dr. Christopher Rossick, the editor of the journal. His credentials are vast. He's one of the smartest guys I know, and he's always careful to speak of our knowledge on sexuality in measured terms. All Gregory Coles has is conjecture based off the genetic fallacy that if the organization publishing the study has a stated agenda, then the study itself must be erroneous. All Coles is doing is revealing his own bias by leading with genetic fallacies rather than with a critique of the actual merits of the study. But regardless of the credibility of the Journal of Human Sexuality, Dr. Pila was aware that people would act in bad faith, just like Gregory Coles, and accused the journal of bias. So her original plan was to have the article published in some other journal, preferably one that would be of a higher index in the databases. Watch the interview I did with Dr. Pila and Dr. Nicolosi early this year. Data collection was finished around 2018, so why wasn't it published right away? Because for the next three years, Dr. Pila was presenting her findings to various journals and it underwent rigorous peer review, and she made adjustments to address their critiques. But even after doing all that, eventually the journals would back out and refuse to publish. Not because the data is bad, but because they knew the political implications and backlash they would face if they published it. That is publication bias. She only brought it to the Journal of Human Sexuality as a last resort. He continues, This ideological alignment is especially notable given that ATCSI, and therefore the Journal of Human Sexuality, is funded by donations. 
They're registered as a 501c3 tax-exempt charity. Yeah. The journal's homepage has a button that pleads... Oh my gosh. Help fund this vital publication. Click to donate. When a journal is funded by donations given with a clear ideological motivation, we shouldn't be surprised if that journal publishes articles that align neatly with the ideological motivations of its donors. Publishing what donors want to read is a time-honored strategy for financial solu solubility. This is ridiculous, and really despicable. The Alliance is a grassroots organization. It has to be. We don't rely on government grants and the huge donations that the LGBT lobby has. The LGBT lobby has huge coffers, and they've been aligned with the APA and the ACA and the all the other... Uh, counseling and social work associations for decades okay they don't have any real opposition we do do you think the APA and ACA don't have an ideology they're promoting have you seen the APA's division 44 do you want to see more therapy bans and LGBT coercion in our schools media and public policies all these policies forcing people with same-sex attraction to adopt only one narrative are based on falsehoods about conversion therapy and how it is inherently harmful and ineffective to therapeutically explore change and attraction feelings. Well, the Alliance stands on the shoulders of decades of experience showing that thoughts, feelings, and self-labels do change. And now we're providing empirical data to show it. Which, honestly, this is how most research is done. Proving something professionals tend to already know from experience because we need experimental evidence, not just conventional wisdom, to prove something. And you would rather take the side of the LGBT lobby and undermine it? Hmm. Which dog do you have in this fight? Is holding onto your gay identity so important to you that you would want to discourage others from exploring fluidity in theirs? And his final attacks before finishing part one is particularly low. We should also consider the editorial board at the Journal of Human Sexuality. Their about page lists only one name among their editorial board of advisors, Philip M. Sutton, Ph.D. If this name seems familiar to you, it's because Dr. Sutton is the co-author of the study in question. It is, of course, possible to imagine an essay co-written by the sole member of a journal's editorial board undergoing a rigorous vetting process before being published in that journal. But it does strain the imagination. Questioning the integrity of Dr. Sutton is cheap. I've met Dr. Sutton many times. He's one of the humblest, most kind-hearted men I know. He exudes the complete opposite of arrogance and deception. He would not do anything to jeopardize the integrity of the publication. So. Dr. Nicolosi was in contact with Gregory Coles about that point. He made it clear that, just like in any journal for a specialized topic, it's standard protocol for editors or board members to step aside from the review process for one of their own studies. And that's exactly what Dr. Sutton did. But does Gregory Coles remove that part from his blog? No, he only adds the clarification as a footnote, which reads, Dr. Nicolosi Jr. has made the following clarifying statement about Dr. Sutton's editorial role. Phil Sutton was not a peer reviewer for his own study. In a small field of academic study, it's not unusual for an author who is also a peer review board to step down and allow others to do the peer review, peer review work for them. This is the norm for all very specialized journals in all branches of science. That's what happened with this article. And while we're at it, behold the level of pettiness Gregory Coles resorts to. Quote, as of this writing, the website actually lists him as Philp rather than Philip. Well, Gregory, you're also missing punctuation there. And speaking of punctuation, because the Reintegrative Therapy Association's website mistakenly used a hyphen after an adverb ending in L-Y, Gregory Coles apparently couldn't resist handing out a grammar police citation. A punctuational word to the wise. Words ending in L-Y are not typically followed by hyphens in well-edited formal English. I gotta tell you, this is not a good start, Gregory. Your criticisms of the study are petty, 
and lacks substance and any degree of good faith. So far, your argument consists just of genetic fallacies. That's quite sad, especially for an individual and group that has so much influence in the church. You really should be ashamed of yourselves. Let's see if he fares any better in part two. In our last episode, I suggested that the Journal of Human Sexuality isn't a highly credible venue for a groundbreaking study of sexual orientation change to be published. Still, a dubious venue doesn't necessarily mean that the research published there is bad. In fact, if other publishing venues are hostile towards a scientific study's legitimate findings, dubious fringe venues might be the only place where legitimate scientific work can gain an audience. So if you admit to this, why did you spend your entire first article making this argument? What, are you relying on the ignorance of your audience to be won over by fallacy? Well, now he wants to judge the merits of the study, and he thinks he has a gotcha moment right out the gate. According to the abstract, this two-year longitudinal study featured 75 adult male participants. In reading the study itself, we learn that this is true, but not the whole truth. In fact, 105 adult males began the study, and by the end of two years, only 22 of them remained. Of the original 105 participants who took the pretest, the baseline survey against which future results could be measured every six months, 30 participants left the study in less than six months, never completing the first post-test. This left 75 participants whose six-month post-test data could be analyzed. At the one-year post-test mark, only 53 participants provided data. At the 18-month mark, only 28 participants. And at the two-year mark, only 22 participants. Of those who stopped participating in the study, the majority did so because they stopped using reintegrative therapy. Well, duh, because they finished counseling. In other words, the study was truly a longitudinal two-year study, and it did in fact have 75 participants, but only 22 of those participants were actually studied for the full two years. The other 53 discontinued therapy before then. This places the study's retention rate at a striking low 29%. I think it should be strikingly low, Gregory. You might want to check your grammar there. By comparison, the average retention rate for longitudinal studies with most, mostly male participants is around 70%. Most of Gregory Cole's criticism from this point forward hinges on his critical misperception that the study required each participant to complete two years of treatment. At least that's the insinuation that, or implication that he insinuates throughout the stu his articles. But contrary to Cole's misperception, there was no requirement that each participant complete two years of treatment. And Pila and Sutton on page 71 says, In routine clinical settings, clients autonomously end treatment for a variety of reasons. Often treatment ends because either the client, the therapist, or both believe that the therapeutic goals were met or have determined that the treatment has plateaued in its effects. Other reasons for ending treatment include geographic relocation, changes in insurance coverage, or the desire to pursue other treatment options. Since the study took place in such a real-life clinical setting, treatment length was individualized according to the needs of the participants and therefore varied for each participant." Unquote. Cole seems to have expected each participant to do the assessments the same number of times. But Pila and Sutton already addressed this issue on page 71. Quote, Longitudinal research requires analysis of incomplete data sets that does not introduce the bias inherent by dropping entire cases, as is required when using the repeated measures ANOVA. The repeated measures ANOVA requires the same number of repetitions of the measure for each participant, in contrast to the linear mixed model." Unquote. The fact is, data was collected over five years, but individual clients were assessed only up to two years. 
and that is more than sufficient for a longitudinal study. They didn't need to keep being measured after they discharge for it to continue to be longitudinal. And what Table 3 shows us is that most people completed therapy around one year. They weren't required to do therapy for two years or to be measured for two years post-therapy. We see in Table 3 that the biggest changes were experienced in the first six months. Eventually, people with the most significant changes finished therapy. They weren't quitters, as Coles is arguing or insinuating. The study didn't lose retention. You can see right there in the table that the majority of participants experienced significant progress early on. It might even be that the 30 who ended therapy before the first post-test ended therapy because they experienced such significant change before six months. That's possible, uh, especially when you look at the comparison in the uh, pre-test between that cohort and those who continued past six months. You see that the demographics and the, uh, the information is pretty much the same. Anyway, it would be unethical to force them to stay in therapy beyond the point of necessity. The clients who continued past 18 or 24 months were those with the greater challenges, most likely dual diagnoses of other mental illnesses that required more attention and might also have been interfering with the trauma reprocessing. But Gregory misunderstands the research so much that he thinks the complete opposite. He writes, wouldn't people who continue opting into and paying for an expensive niche therapy approach be more likely to be the ones who think it's working? Conversely, wouldn't this mean that anyone who finds the therapy not working for them is far more likely to drop out of therapy and thus drop out of the study before the next six month check-in point? Accordingly, wouldn't this skew the gathered data disproportionately in favor of those who feel they are succeeding at becoming straighter? Let's suppose, though, that all these people dropping out of reintegrative therapy are doing so because they feel it's been effective. Wouldn't it be helpful to continue collecting data from these participants after they finish therapy to confirm that their newfound heterosexuality persists beyond the conclusion of their therapy? Let's address that last part. Sure. Dr. Pila could have chosen to keep tracking people after discharge, but she didn't need to. It's a very labor-intensive method. She chose to design the study this way, and that's perfectly legitimate for a longitudinal study. Why weren't people measured after discharge? I can only speculate, but I suspect one reason is we cannot account for experiences they may have had after therapy. It wouldn't be fair to judge the effectiveness of an intervention if there could be other life experiences and choices that could undermine the progress achieved while in therapy. Uh, here's an example concerning, say, depression. In therapy, depression decreases. Afterward, it could raise or lower based on new experiences, maybe like a loss or uh, a breakup. And a p-value, which is a statistical measure of probability, would not be valid if using a measure from outside of therapy. People don't just stop living after ending therapy. Nevertheless, the authors recommend further research include post-therapy follow-up measures. So, Gregory, feel free to conduct your own study. You're apparently a senior research fellow. We would love to see more prospective research on this topic. As he continues, we see that he's carrying with him a lot of baggage into his reading of the research. See how he exaggerates the supposed pattern of testimonies of ex-LGBT people to support his suspicion that the participants of this study actually experienced significant change early on. Quote, In previous decades, the pattern of sexual orientation change testimonies has been for people to assert their change orientation for a period of time, then later admit that they never really became straight and were instead influenced by wishful thinking and social pressures. In light of this pattern, the purportedly longitudinal nature of the Pila and Sutton study is especially important. Yet even this two-year time frame 
applies to only 22 of the 105 participants originally recruited. He keeps putting quotes around longitudinal, as if trying to discredit that aspect of the study. But I really want to call into question his pattern of ex-LGBT testimonies. That might be a pattern of certain people who have desisted or, or relapsed or uh, rather uh, gone back to identifying as gay. But that's not necessarily the majority or the trend among the hundreds of people who have identified as ex-LGBT or who have repented of homosexuality and no longer identify as gay or or had unwanted same-sex attractions and and have experienced some degree of change. This is not necessarily the pattern. You might be skewing and exaggerating the degree to which you've seen that pattern with, say, the XX gay population. And then he keeps harping on how only 22 people did full two years of the therapy. And so he's like, but those 22 participants definitely became straighter, right? To answer that question, we need to evaluate study design and category errors. And here Gregory will put on full display a misunderstanding of the research design and results. But first he puts this, quote, the fact that this study relies on participants self-reports of their attractions is by no means damning, but it's certainly noteworthy. Human beings aren't always the most accurate judges of how their own unbidden attractions are occurring especially when they're highly incentivized to want a certain answer to be true. I was roughly 13 years old the first time I told someone that my attraction to the same sex was definitely getting a little better, by which I meant that I was becoming straighter. I believed at the time that I was telling the truth, but in retrospect, I only thought it was the truth because I so deeply wanted, even philosophically needed, it to be the truth. All that to say, self-report is a wily creature. Yes, Gregory, self-report is not 100% reliable. But what's your alternative when it comes to something like sexual attraction, feelings, and thoughts? Or really anything psychological for that matter? He at least admits this in his footnote. Quote, But short of penile plethysmography, the measure of blood flow in the penis, which is sometimes used as a way to measure sexual arousal in males, it's tricky to imagine what better metric of sexual attraction we could use. And it's even trickier to imagine a bunch of males willingly signing up for a study involving penile plethysmography. Unquote. But if you're going to have such skepticism for self-report, we should definitely throw out all the retrospective data the APA and government legislatures have been relying upon to justify their therapy bans. At least the Pila and Sutton study used a standardized self-report instrument prospectively. With this next part, he just gets more laughable. The more significant concern about study design lies in the way attraction is defined and measured. The study measures the degrees of participants' same-sex attraction and opposite-sex attraction by asking them about their sexual behavior, kissing, thoughts, feelings, and sexual identity. While all these data points may, might be interesting, only thoughts and feelings have to do with sexual orientation per se. Really? Let me just interject there. I, for instance, have never engaged in any same-sex sexual behavior or kissing, but these things don't make me any less oriented toward the same sex. By a similar token, a person who engages in frequent sexual behavior before therapy and decides to live chastely after therapy is now more chaste, but they are not necessarily any less gay in their orientation. What about sexual identity? Here we see the same alchemy that previous Christian sexual orientation change efforts be became adept in once they began to realize people's ori sexual orientation wasn't really changing. They emphasized the importance of no longer self-describing as gay. A person who still experienced same-sex attractions, but no longer call themselves gay, could be counted as not gay, and therefore as proof of the movement's success. I'll just interject real quick there. How a participant decides to identify themselves is really individualized, and could be based off any sort of factors. Their degree of same-sex attraction, they're like, well, because I 
have such a decrease in those attractions, I don't see myself as gay. Or maybe they're choosing to do what we all should do, base their orientation not on their feelings, but on the design of their bodies, on their, their actual, based on something that is a more stable reality, their biology. I don't know. It's up to each person how they answered that. He continues, While the Pila and Sutton study, to its credit, keeps sexual identity distinct from the other four metrics of attraction, it still uses data about people's changing self-description of their sexual identity to make an argument about orientation change. Far more problematically, the authors lump sexual behavior, kissing, thoughts, and feelings together into two generalized metrics they call same-sex attraction experiences and opposite-sex attraction experiences. By using these lumped together metrics to make claims about orientation change, they render their data useless to offer any meaningful understanding of mere orientation, especially since the majority of their clients are religiously motivated and would desire to pursue chastity even apart from a change in their sexual attractions. Useless, he says. To demonstrate how unhelpful these metrics are for measuring sexual orientation, imagine that a man exclusively attracted to other men went into therapy, then decided to start kissing a lot of women. Thanks to the structure of this study, his opposite sex attraction experience number would skyrocket, thereby demonstrating a miraculous change in orientation. That orientation change would have no impact on his continuing exclusive attraction to other men." Unquote. Wow! There's a lot of misunderstanding there, so let's dig in. As I've mentioned earlier, sexual orientation is not a well-defined construct. It's not just about thoughts and feelings. Therefore, the instrument used to measure sexuality, the Sexuality Assessment Questionnaire, breaks down so-called orientation into multiple dimensions, or subdomains, feelings, thoughts, behavior, and identity. And it provides separate scales for both same-sex and opposite-sex attraction experiences. For the sake of simplicity, the results combine feelings, thoughts, and behavior when speaking of sexual attraction experiences. What exactly is the problem with that? the researchers averaged each of the sexuality dimensions, which is normal in psychotherapy outcome research when subdomains can't be perfectly quantified in relationship to one another. For example, is same-sex behavior weighed more heavily than same-sex identity? When in doubt about non-quantifiable variables within the same domain, the rule of thumb is to average, which the authors did. This doesn't render the data useless, like he's saying. It's just not as high definition as some people would prefer. So his silly example of a man exclusively attracted to men going off and kissing a bunch of women, that would not skyrocket his OSA because it would still have to average out. Okay, It's not going to have as big a weight, him doing something totally disproportionate to the rest of his presentation. <sighs> Over an extended period of time, as this longitudinal study would show, people tend to act consistent between their thoughts, feelings, and actions. And even if the behavior was the only thing that changed while the thoughts and feelings remained strongly same-sex attracted, it wouldn't produce a strong enough effect to be as clinically and statistically significant as it was in this study. What we see in this study is a p-value of 0 .0001. That means that the probability of these changes occurring outside of the intervention is 1 in a 1,000. In other words, it's highly unlikely that these are just natural changes we see occurring. Instead, it's because of the interventions, because of the therapy, that we're seeing these changes. And then he ends part two with what he seems to think is a real takedown of the study. So perhaps it would have been better for the researchers to parse out changes 
in kissing and sexual activity from changes in thoughts and feelings. But do the data at least show some people seeming to move towards heterosexuality? Not exactly. Let's finally talk about findings. When we look at the average rating of 75 participants same-sex attraction experiences at the beginning of the study and compare it to the average rating of 22 participants same-sex attraction experiences two years later at the end of the study, we see that the number does indeed go down, dropping from 2.63 on a 5-point Likert scale to 2.39. Likewise, the rating for opposite sex attraction experiences goes up, and the rating comparing sexual identity self-descriptions indicates a shift away from gay identity. Once again, though, he's making a mistake there, comparing the 75 participants to the 22 who did 24 months of therapy. There's no need to do that. But because he does that, he's going to get himself really tripped up here with his conclusions. So, let's continue. But when we study the numbers more closely, an odd trend emerges. Even though the participants' final rating of their same-sex attraction experiences at the two-year mark, 2.39, is lower than their initial report, it is actually higher than the same-sex attraction experiences they reported at the 18-month mark, 2.12. The one-year mark, 2.19, or even the six-month mark, 2.32. In other words, the final six months of the study seem to show people becoming more gay in their sexual orientation, not less so. They increased from 2.12 back up to 2.39, undoing more than half of their progress toward heterosexuality. If the study had continued for another six months, and the same trend had continued, the remaining participants would apparently have been even gayer than they were when they entered therapy in the first place. The same is true for the opposite sex attraction numbers. These numbers steadily increase until the 18 month mark, then suddenly plummet back almost as low as their starting rate. Even sexual identity starts to make a swing back toward its gay self identification. The careful reader then can't help but wonder what happened after the study ended and the data stopped being collected. Did participants remain in precisely the same state of sexual attraction as were reported at the end of the study, slightly less gay than, the, than when they started? Or did their experiences continue to evolve, perhaps moving in the inconvenient direction indicated by the last set of data? Did they wind up even gayer than they started? The study doesn't tell us, alas. The study can't tell us. So, is reintegrative therapy making people straight? Or at least straighter? Their website will tell you that the answer is yes. Uh, no, it won't, because we don't use those terms, gay or straight. Anyway. But their website will also tell you that they know this because of large-scale, longitudinal, peer-reviewed evidence showing significant changes in sexual attraction. Now that you've seen that evidence for yourself, I'll let you decide whether it's worth believing." Unquote. I've already addressed this earlier, so I'm just repeating myself at this point. All of Gregory's argument rests on his earlier misunderstanding of the longitudinal nature of the study. He seems to be under the assumption that participants had to do two years of therapy to get the full effect of re reintegrative therapy or at least that they had to be measured for two full years to know how effective the therapy was. Hence why he insists that the 22 remaining be compared to the total 75. This makes no sense. No social scientist would make a comparison between the two as a reflection of generalizability or effectiveness of the treatment. The statistically correct method of ascertaining the overall effectiveness of the therapy in longitudinal research is to assess the average effects of the 75 participants, not compare the 75 with the 22. But once again, the data shows us that the majority of people finishing therapy before two years had the greatest degree of benefit. There wasn't some sort of upswing in same-sex attraction after the majority of the 75 completed treatment, but the 22 remained. They didn't all start the same time. Data collected was 
data was collected over multiple years, people started at different points in those five years. Okay? So it's not like, oh, once the majority of people left the study, then the remainder had an upswing. No. It just meant that with the absence of early completers, those who made sufficient progress early on, the statistics, the mean score, changed to reflect more of those who continued for two years. And those who continued into two years still experienced benefit, but not as much as those who finished earlier. And there could be a variety of reasons for that, such as, most likely, their co-occurring conditions that require more attention and could interfere with trauma reprocessing work. The study is too small to, to parse out those reasons, because that final number of, of individuals at 24 months is only 22. So help us do more studies if you want the answer to that question. What is it about those 22 people who did two years of therapy that makes them different from those who ended therapy earlier? Well, there's another factor to consider. The participants did not have to be men who wanted to go from gay to straight, as you like to say. That's what's most fascinating about this particular study. The inclusion criterion was simply to be a man with same-sex attractions who was open to a sexuality changing and willing to undergo a trauma treatment. If a participant decided partway through the process, or even at the outset, that he wanted to retain a gay identity, he wanted to say he's gay, and, and even that he wanted to pursue a homosexual life and uh, relationships. He was not dropped from the study. He was still included. So that tends to skew things toward the homosexual or the same-sex attraction experiences and same-sex identification, especially when those are the individuals who persisted after the majority of people who experienced more benefit and a change in their attractions and identity left. Furthermore, as we tell our clients, intentionally trying to force a change in one's sexual feelings might actually interfere with the trauma reprocessing process. The participant's task was to work on resolving traumatic memories and just let whatever happens happen. The study included some men who were determined to still identify as gay. That's what really distinguishes this from so-called conversion therapy. If it really were conversion therapy, those clients would have been referred out early on, and the outcomes would have been skewed even more toward change. But you're getting realistic data from real-life clients with a variety of co-occurring clinical concerns and we're still seeing statistically significant change in sexuality. And yes, even clinically significant changes in sexuality. It may be hard to believe when you see the numbers are still in the 2 range, like 2.39 and 2.12, it might not seem that significant. But if you graph it out, those differences are pronounced. Well, not to be outdone by himself, Gregory Coles posted a follow-up blog about it a discrepancy in the PDF of the Peel and Sutton study that was posted on the Alliance's website. Table 3 had different figures depending on when you access the site. This was legitimately curious to me as well. So you know what I did, Greg? I contacted the Journal of Human Sexuality and spoke to Chris Rossick, the editor. They were aware of the error and later posted this explanation, which you can find right on their website where you access this, the article. Amazing what inquiry instead of speculation can do. So here's what they posted. It has come to our attention that there has been confusion regarding Table 3 of the article by Pila and Sutton. Specifically, one version of the article contains some numeric values that are different than another version. We have looked into this matter and have determined the following likely scenario for how this unfortunate inaccuracy occurred. Prior to the study's publication in September of 2021, we discovered in a final proof that Table 3 contained the same mean and standard deviation for the 12, 18, and 24-month follow-up statistics for both same-sex attraction experience and opposite-sex attraction experience. 
Realizing that the likelihood of such exact similarity would be exceedingly rare, we consulted with Dr. Pila, and she found that, indeed, there had been a copy-and-paste error in her submission, and she provided us with the corrected Table 3. This table was in the originally published version of the study, which came out in September of 2021. Subsequent to this publication, some formatting changes were done on the article that had nothing to do with the adjusting of any of these statistical results. But apparently this occurred on the older, uncorrected version of the study, which then was linked to from our website. This escaped our awareness until being recently brought to our attention. We have now reinstated links to the correct version of the study with an accurate Table 3. It is also possible that the inaccurate version of the study is circulating on the internet from other sources. We sincerely apologize for any confusion this may have caused or any perception that the journal was not acting with complete scientific integrity, which is very important to us. We also want to thank the multiple sources who noticed the discrepancy and brought it to our attention. We are highly cognizant of how essential it is for the science surrounding sexual attraction fluidity exploration and therapy to be above reproach. At a time when an emerging literature is challenging and refining conventional narratives regarding change-exploring therapies, we take seriously our responsibility to provide readers with reliable information they can trust." Unquote. So, now that I've fully responded to Gregory Cole's evidence that the Pila and Sutton study of reintegrative therapy is not compelling or valid, I'll let you decide if he's worth believing. What do you think? Join me in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and share. Now, until next time, Jesus loves you freely, fully, faithfully, and fruitfully.